Hi, and welcome to That's Not A Lot Of Data. This talk will focus on three main themes. Uh, on the one hand, the operation of cloud native and also FinOps stacks. On the other hand, financial data visualization and why the real power is in the intersection between those two. For everything you'll see, I'm asking you to keep in mind that you can use literally the same technologies to run your stacks, to inform, optimize, operate them, and to do the same with the resulting financial data, again, to inform, optimize, operate. Above all, the point is you can bring this seamlessly together to allow deeper understanding of the interdependencies between those two sides of your metal. Your metal. So, as usual, when speaking in front of new audiences, I'm, I'm breaking out the bragging slides. This is less about me having specific laurels. It's a lot more about that validating, yes, this person actually knows what they're talking about. If you truly care about this, you can simply look at this in the conference proceedings and also the slides are linked at the end at the end of this talk. Um, maybe from, of specific relevance for this audience, um, I was responsible for the internet endpoints of oil wells in, in basically warlord country. And Architect implemented and operated the complete IT networking security side of the gold vending machines. You might have seen him operating on top of the Burj Khalifa and elsewhere. And well, there's more. Anyway, back to the basics. So if you look at this Stahlschlüssel, um, 200 years ago, you could easily have won wars with these tales about, about steel recipes, about the required tempering, resulting physical properties and such. Go back a little bit further, logbooks from centuries ago, they talk about cargo taking on, cargo unloaded, about the cargo being sold, about whales sighted and caught, but also they talk about temperatures, about uh, of the water, of wind levels and such. And today, scientists are working through all those old logbooks because this data holds immense value today. Even farther back, 4,000 years ago, the first letter, which we know of, it's about wrong grade of copper being delivered, about provisional payment being made, and the seller being rude to the buyer's servant. Going back 2,000 years more, 6,000 years ago, this is probably the oldest writing which we are currently aware of. It talks about who owned which slaves and when. The point is, I, I don't need to convince you that uh, that numbers and events are important and that they are inherently tied to, to humanity, how we operate, to the value which we create and which we distribute and then trade with each other. Um, without all of this um, data, humanity couldn't run. And the thing is, no matter if it's actual operational data or financial data or, or something else, um, fundamentally this is all the same from the point of view of technology. And no, I will not go get into the details of data being singular versus plural. I'm just following Wall Street Journal um, in, in their style guide. So let's look at the observability side of things. Observability is an absolute buzzword. It's all the rage in tech. Um, if you look at control theory, it's basically just a way to deduct the internal state of a system by looking at the outputs and inputs only. You don't know anything about the thing itself, you just look at inputs, outputs, and it allows you to deduce the complete internal state of the thing. Which is obviously nice if you if you have to deal with lots of different systems and also it, it puts very good requirements on, on when you can actually claim that you understand a system, that you understand a thing. Contrary to this, monitoring has taken more this this meaning of collecting and not really using data. Um, two particularly extreme examples uh, would be where everything you have, you just do full text indexing without actually caring about the cost uh, in, in money, in time, in resources, which this incurs. Or the other extreme where you have data lakes, which is, in my opinion, a euphemism of no one will ever look at this again. Like maybe if you if you have data scientists uh, who really look at, at like long running old historical data beyond this, like for example, the logbooks of, of old ships, um, in those cases, yes. But beyond this, uh, oftentimes it's just an excuse to basically not have to actually have any plan what to do with stuff and just collect it more or less, um, which is not what we actually want. I mean, even if I'm just storing it without an index, it still incurs cost um, in, in storage, in power, in just having to manage it, migrate it to backup it. All this is cost. So those extremes and not actually deriving value from the data is, 
is this kind of meaning which monitoring has started to take on. Personally, I use them interchangeably, but you see this distinction in, in the market. Um, so at a very basic level, observability is about enabling humans and machines to understand and predict complex systems. Why machines? I mean, a lot of this is pretty close to AI ML. Um, it's not absolutely there, but a lot of the properties are the same, which again, goes into this inform optimize operate cycle. And the thing is, oftentimes, if you have different fields, everyone has more or less, <coughs> sorry, fundamentally the same needs. But uh, when they come up with concept and solutions, sometimes literally the same ones, there is different names and terms for the same thing. And in our case, like you would say, observability and and proper operations in, in cloud native world. Whereas in FinOps, this inform, optimize, operate uh, cycle is, is more well known, but at a very fundamental level, those are equivalent, which is nice. Of course, that means you can get all those nice uh, cloud native things for FinOps, the problems being solved are actually the same. One thing is different. The scale of cloud native stuff is a lot higher as per usual than in FinOps. So you just have more, more leeway in how you choose to, to use those tools because you just have them designed for a lot more data, which in turn means you can use those deeper analysis, those quicker systems to your benefit. So let's look at those systems. Starting with Prometheus, as per usual. Um, Prometheus 101, it's a time series database. It's inspired by Google Sporkmon. It's the standard in cloud native uh, deployments. It's the standard for Kubernetes, which you most likely have heard of. Uh, we have, uh, I'm part of Prometheus team. We have um, PromQL, which is a specific language. It's a functional language, which you use for everything, processing, graphing, alerting, exporting. All data operations are through this one language, which yes, means on the one hand, you have to learn that language. On the other hand, it means you, no matter how you work with the data, you literally use the same mechanism every single time, which is incredibly powerful because you don't have to rewrite something from an inert into, into analysis. It's literally the same query. And we don't have hierarchical data models in Prometheus. We have those n-dimensional label sets where you can slice and dice your data as you currently need it. Um, important point here, labels in Prometheus land are not precisely the same as labels in IML. The labels as we use them in Prometheus are a very good basis for labeling in AIML, but the terms are not precisely equivalent. But they share a lot of the same properties, and, and I've been told by our AIML people that working with Prometheus data to do AIML is a lot easier than with many other databases. Of course, so many properties are, are shared between those two. So what are time series? Time series are uh, recorded values which change over time. If you have uh, a lot of individual events which matter, you can you can merge them into time series and just count them or something which goes up and down. Temperatures in a data center uh, service latency, but also the price of, of stock or how many uh, coins have been mined and those kinds of things are basically all time series, just how it changes over time. It's super easy to, to emit all of this towards the Prometheus, Prometheus ecosystem. So if you if you want to write I don't know a function in your Excel or what have you that is actually doable I know people who who do this kind of thing and it's really really easy. The scale of Prometheus um, ingesting a million samples per second is not a problem on current hardware. Um, so roughly it's two hundred k samples per core per second. Uh, we compress quite quite aggressively, which is nice for for storage and long term storage. The largest single Prometheus instance, which we know of, is 100 million active series at the same time, and that worked. Um, for long-term storage, there are two solutions which Prometheus team members are actually working on them. There's a lot of others, but like the, the primary ones would be Cortex and Thanos. Thanos is historically easier to run, slower in, in querying and such. I forgot to write slower in querying. Um, it, works by scaling storage horizontally. Cortex um, is historically harder to run. It's gotten a lot easier uh, recently. That initially started with scaling um, the query and ingestion layer, and then took the storage uh, scaling code from Thanos and guess what Thanos is doing with, uh, with the querying and such uh, code of, of Cortex. The largest instant at Grafana Labs. 
um, is 65 million active series with a cost of 670 CPU cores and 3.4 terabytes of RAM. Um, we have a customer who's running at 3 billion active series, which is like not a little. Grafana Loki. Loki is based on the same label sets as Prometheus. It does not have a full text index, which is part of why it's so quick. Um, it works with quite the scale of logs, if I do say so myself. We are looking at high numbers of terabytes with, with surprisingly little cost. Um, as you have the same labels on your logs and your metrics, you can seamlessly jump between those two. Like you have a stock which is emitted and they have, I don't know, news article, what have you. You can tie this directly to how the stock develops or what have you. Of course, <clears throat> the metadata attached to them and to, to actually access those things are literally the same if you do it right. And that also means that you can trivially, uh, trivially turn um, your events into metrics and then do a lot deeper analysis on the already pre uh, contextualized data which you have in your metrics. Super nice. Um, and you can basically ingest every time of uh, every every type of of events into Loki. Um, it looks pretty much the same. This is a not super deep technical one uh, or, or talk. So let's just do the quick thing here. You have a timestamp. You have the same label set, and then you have the opaque string, which is not indexed, and that's part of the magic of of Loki. Um, Queries internally, we regularly see 40 gigabytes um, per second and more in query speed. Uh, we query terabytes of event data in, in under a minute and then do complex analysis on those results of the data sets. We have a not official number of, of terabytes of data uh, in those clusters. And we have a cost of 270 uh, CPU cores and 1.5 terabytes of RAM, which for this amount of data and for the fact that we keep ingesting all the time and keep querying all the time um, is pretty decent, I would say. I'm kind of biased. Um, now we have Grafana Tempo. That's more relevant for the operational side, not so much for the finance data itself just the nature of, of the data. Um, tempo is for, for traces and for spans, which basically tells you how you walk through a uh, through the program code in a particular execution of, of this piece of code, which is relevant for the developers if they want to debug or if they want to understand why they have high latency or why a certain decision was made. It's super useful to, to know how you worked, uh, how you walked or how the program or the computer walked through this particular instance of, of that execution of the code. Um, yeah, again, it's more for the operational and for the debugging of your stuff, not so much for, for the finance data itself. Um, there's a super nice concept introduced with Tempo or introduced to, to the wider world. It was available at certain search engines for, uh, for quite some time, exemplars, um, where you basically just attach an ID to, um, to your traces and then you can jump directly from your logs, from your uh, metrics into those traces. Because usually you have this needle in haystack problem. You have an immense amount of traces and you don't know which are the relevant ones. And then you need to search through them and that just, it takes time, it, it takes, it incurs cost, both human and computer. Um, but if you attach this already to your to your logs and to your metrics, you can say, I have this one high latency in, in this and that request and I shouldn't have that course, it's for trading or whatever you. Um, and you can jump directly into the thing or you have this one error state and you can jump directly from that log line into your trace and see why it's happening or your developers can. Um, yeah. Tempo will, uh, is also currently getting uh, searching and such for people who, who use it, but the recommended way, so to speak, is to go through exemplars. Uh, you don't need any any um, hugely expensive infrastructure on the backend. It's literally just object storage, S3, what have you, and, and Ceph, and you just go. It's 100% compatible with all the relevant um, players in the market, both emitting and ingesting. And at least at our scale, we don't do sampling. We have all the traces, which is super nice because you don't have that problem where you have a super highly relevant trace and then you cannot get at the data, um, which is not good. Our largest cluster is ingesting 2.2 million samples per second and 350 megabytes per second. And this data is already like two months old. 
Um, with 14 days retention, three copies stored, cost of 204 CPU cores, 450 gigs of RAM, 132 terabyte of object storage, and still we have a P99 of under 2.5 seconds, which is nice. Grafana itself. Um, you, might, you most likely know what Grafana is. If you don't know what Grafana is, the short version is it's a fully open source tool to visualize data to democratize the creation of these visualizations, enabling everyone to create those beautiful, intuitive, informative dashboards. Um, and yes, it's pitchy, but it's the truth. People can make this themselves without having to, without having to have studied computer science or anything. It's pretty easy. Um, I've, I've seen non-tech people do this and it just works and you can do it yourself. You don't have to share your, your secret sauce about this and that analysis with anyone else. You can actually do this yourself. Um, another su super nice property is that you can take the same data and visualize it in a lot of different ways, which enables you to just get a different understanding of interdependency correlations, causations in your data uh, to, to get literally a different view into the same data sets. I could show you endless, endless, endless amounts of where I have the literal same data and just show it differently or also different data and show it differently, um, which allows me again to, to look into my data, but also to correlate between completely different data sets. Like maybe I realized that I, I know during my backup times, I have a little bit more latency in my trading software and I don't want that. And this kind of thing where I, where I can correlate um, trades executed versus something completely different in the IT stack. That's this power of this system where I can put all the things at once and do the analysis across all that data at once. That's, that's the true power here. You can play with this yourself, literally, uh, play Grafana Org. Um, free for the taking. You can just click around and, and see what you like and what you don't like. And that's the visualization side of Grafana, but there's also the business side of Grafana. Half of the Fortune 50 um, are paying for our technology. Almost everyone in Fortune 50 is using our technology. It's part of our business model and how we, it's part of open source that not every one of them has to pay us and that's fine. Like you get indemnification, a little bit more features and speed and such, um, but you can run this yourself. And as you can see, almost everyone, almost everyone large does, um, and half of them find it well enough that, that they actually want to pay for that privilege. We keep getting reward, uh, awards, so I'm, I'm not going to walk through every single one of them. Uh, the most relevant one for this audience will be the JPMC uh, Hall of Innovation Award, uh, top vendor of 2022. Not a small feat in, they don't give this out lightly. Um, anyone who has worked with JPMC will know that they're extremely demanding and extremely particular about what precisely they want and need, which is great to work with. Um, and apparently we're not doing it wrong. You might also have heard of this thing called Robin Hood and, and the GameStop, uh, GameStop stocks. Uh, Robin Hood gave a talk recently at GrafanaCon, um, and you can watch this, it's recorded, just Google for that thing. A two-people team was running a Prometheus instance with 100 million active series. Then came GameStop, and with our help, they scaled up to 700 million time series and basically kept Robin Hood able to, to observe and to run and to operate their own stack during this GameStop frenzy. I told you there would be more. We'll be talking publicly about the results of a recent internal hackathon soon. Um, and if you always wanted to build a Bloomberg terminal with your own data and official data and just mix this together into your own thing, well, now you can. And the nice thing is, all of this or most of this is open source and you can run it yourself. You don't have to pay us. You don't have to pay anyone else. You don't have to have anyone watch what your secret uh, sources. You can run all of this yourself if you want to. No problem. It's also all available on-prem and cloud as a service. I, that's, that's how we get paid. I like food and shelter. So if you were to buy from Grafana, I'm definitely not complaining. And that's it. 
Unfortunately, for COVID reasons, I cannot join you in person. Um, we have a few co-workers in the room, and they will be more than happy to to take your answer, uh, to take your questions, uh, give replies. Um, my contact information is here. All the other talks uh, which I've gave, uh, which I've given, are also listed here. And in particular, if you want to have deeper technical view on on what I just talked about and different angles which which are maybe a little bit more useful for the more technical minded people a lot of this can be found at at the last link on the slide so yeah again thank you very much and I hope to maybe potentially see you next year in person until then thank you all right thank you so much I just want to bring up a slide Cool, so thank you, Richard. I'm gonna switch on the microphone. So thank you, Richard. So I really enjoyed that talk because Grafana is well known for infrastructure level monitoring, you know, your CPU, memory, disk. That's certainly how I started with Grafana, but over the last number of years, and you can see in the talk with Richard, is how do we bring in data from the more business side of, so traffic into my website or trades being executed on a trade desk. So how do I correlate business level data with my with my infrastructure data. And we can do this all with Grafana and the technologies that we have. So I don't know if there are any questions. I do have a microphone if you have any questions on how this would actually work uh, you know, on a technical level. I'm happy to answer. My name is Vili. Uh, my colleague is uh, Sam. So he's from engineering. So we're happy to take any questions. Or if anybody on the stream also has some questions. <laughs> All good. Well, thank you so much for coming. Hope you enjoy that. We'll see you around.